The services of Holy Thursday, Friday, and Saturday take on a more urgent tone, depicting as they do the timeline of events leading to Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. At the Vesperal Divine Liturgy of St. Basil on Holy Thursday, sung on Thursday morning by anticipation, we commemorate the institution of the central sacrament of the Christian faith, also known as the Eucharist, meaning Thanksgiving. Communion is the mystery that connects us with each other and Christ. While an exploration of the meaning of this sacrament is well beyond the scope of this presentation, the takeaway is that immediately before his death, Christ directed his followers to partake in Holy Communion in his memory. Through our obedience to his command, we share in his death and resurrection. Receive me today, O Son of God, as a partaker of thy mystic feast. For I will not speak of the mystery to thine enemies. I will not kiss thee as did Judas. But as the thief, I will confess thee. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Customarily, the faithful make every attempt to partake in communion on Holy Thursday, as this is the day when it was instituted. In honor of this holy mystery, wine and oil are permitted on Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday also commemorates the act of complete humility which took place immediately following the Last Supper, in which Christ washes his disciples' feet. In some traditions, bishops reenact this event, washing the feet of the priests. Holy Thursday is also the day when the Holy Chrism, the oil used to seal believers with the gift of the Holy Spirit, is made. Holy Friday Matins are observed Thursday evening. This service is known as the Twelve Gospels service because it includes a reading of twelve gospel lessons that depict Christ's crucifixion and burial. In the middle of this service, just after the fifth gospel reading, a cross bearing the body of Christ is carried in procession around the church and placed in the center of the solea. Today is hung upon the tree he who suspended the land in the midst of the waters. A crown of thorns crowns him, who is the king of angels. He is wrapped about with the purple of mockery, who wrapped the heavens with clouds. He received buffetings, who freed Adam in the Jordan. He was transfixed with nails, who is the son of the virgin. We worship thy passion, O Christ. Show also unto us thy glorious resurrection. The icon of the crucifixion is primarily telling us the story. The crucified Christ is the center of the icon, and on one side and the other you have Mary, John, usually a soldier. Most icons show it towards the end of the story. Christ has died, and you can usually tell that because his head is dropped. Mary and John, the, especially the women, they're there, they're showing their signs of grief, a great Byzantine artistic technique for showing tears or dark triangles under the eyes. Obviously they're very upset about this. So you're seeing the story. There will be a, a wound in Christ's side, so he's, he's already been stabbed with the spear, and coming out of his side will be a, a trickle of red for the blood and a trickle of white the water, white and blue, for the water that comes out of his side. What's so beautiful about the icon, though, is that it's somewhat cleaned up. People would have known what it had looked like, especially you know up until that point, and they knew it was a horrific death. I mean, it's degrading, humiliating, long, probably the worst form of execution humans have come up with. But the icon doesn't reflect that. It doesn't show a beaten up body. It shows a rather regal Christ figure on the cross, as you might think of it, ruling from this place. And so what are we seeing? We're seeing Christ from the cross as a king. So we're meant to reflect on a crucified Christ, a crucified Savior as the king. This service, one of the longest of the year, marks the darkest hour of our journey. Indeed, 
the darkest hour the world has known. God himself came, humble as a lamb, seeking justice for the downtrodden, bringing hope and love to a war-torn world. And they, we, crucified him. And he was crucified as a criminal. He underwent two trials, the religious trial and the civil trial. The religious trial, he was condemned as uh, for blasphemy, for, for claiming to be the Son of God. A civil death, was, he was put to death because he was thought to be a king. And therefore, what? A usurper. And so he undergoes this, uh, the, uh, the, the death of a cross, this inhumane way of dying, the utter humiliation. In fact, in our church, uh, this wonderful icon which depicts both his crucifixion and his uh, uh, burial is called the extreme humility. During his life, a few accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and others rejected him. His life, the Word of God, confronts each of us with the same choice. Will we stand at the cross weeping for the tragic cruelty and injustice we witness? Or are we party to the cruelty and injustice ourselves? Some have called the hymns of Pascha anti-Semitic, since they rail against the Jews who crucified Christ. But the tragic reality expressed in our hymns makes one thing clear. Though we were not there at the time, we share in the guilt of Christ's cruel treatment, the scourging, the spitting, the mocking, and yes, the crucifixion. The irony is that we shared in the cruelty, and yet we are the beneficiaries of his great love and mercy. God pours himself out in an ecstasy of love. And he chases each one of us down like, and like a fool keeps, you know, knocking on our door, like a beggar knocking on our door for crumbs of our love. And, and, and this is not back in 33 AD or just the 14th century when St. Nicholas Cabasalas wrote this. He was writing this in terms of every day while creation is this side of the second coming, God is still pouring himself in an ecstasy of love for us now, you know? And so, and so what does that mean? How do we show up for that? How do we wake up for that? Holy Friday is the only day of the year in which there is no divine liturgy. A strict fast of only raw foods is also observed. On this most solemn and somber of days, the Church leads us to the very verge of despair. The Orthodox tradition of fasting on Friday is a permanent reminder of the darkness and grief that marks Christ's crucifixion. The royal hours of Friday are observed in the morning. Following this service, the faithful are invited to decorate the Kuvukleon, the carved wooden bear used to carry the epitaphios with flowers. Holy Friday afternoon's Vesper service is colloquially called the unnailing, for during this service, the body of Christ is taken down from the cross and wrapped in a white sheet. Later in the service, the epitaphios the embroidered icon that depicts Christ after he has been removed from the cross, along with the icon of Christ's body, are carried in procession around the church and placed in the decorated Kuvukleon. In some traditions, after the service, the faithful will venerate the Kuvukleon and then crawl under it, symbolically entering the grave with Christ. He who clothed himself with light, as it were with a garment, stood naked at the judgment and received blows on his cheek from the hands which he had formed. And when the lawless multitude nailed the Lord of glory to the cross, then the veil of the temple was rent in twain, and the sun was darkened, unable to endure the spectacle of God outraged, before whom all things tremble. Him let us worship. The disciple denied him, and the thief exclaimed, 
Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. On Friday evening, the Saturday Orthros is observed by anticipation. Named for the moving and powerful Lamentations hymns, this service begins on the most somber of tones. But as it progresses, hints of Christ's impending victory emerge. The procession that follows is one of the most dramatic and memorable in Orthodox practice. The clergy lead, followed by bearers carrying the Kuvuklion and the faithful with lit candles. In solemn procession, they slowly walk around the church and through the neighborhood, all the while chanting the Trisagion hymn. At the church entrance, the bearers raise the Kuvuklion and the faithful pass under it into the church. Following the solemnities of Holy Friday, the church was silent on Holy Saturday. There was no celebration of the divine liturgy. Holy Saturday is a day of anticipation. A strict fast is observed. In the morning, the Vesperal Divine Liturgy of St. Basil is sung. It is a vigil celebration. This idea of a vigil celebration has broken down in modern liturgical practice. The original vigil service is now celebrated on Holy Saturday morning. And what was once the early morning uh, Sunday second liturgy has now become the focus of the Paschal Vigil. Although Christ's resurrection is not yet openly declared, it is clear from the tone of the hymns and readings that this event is soon to come. Called the Blessed Sabbath in the early church, it represents the ultimate rest, the interlude between the world that was and the world that is to come. As God rested the seventh day in creation, so creation rests in wondrous anticipation of what the church has called the eighth day an epithet meant to indicate a new life, indeed a new and joyous reality, for death is to be overcome. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. The teachings of the Church regarding Christ's activities while his body lay in the grave are both fascinating and compelling. According to Jewish teachings of the time, the dead, even the righteous, lay asleep in the grave. There was widespread disagreement whether the dead would be resurrected. The Pharisees believed in it, while the Sadducees did not. According to the scriptures, Christ descends into this place and destroys death, thereby liberating those bound by death and raising them up to paradise. And this icon depicts Christ clothed, victorious, in bright garments with a glory surrounding his entire body. The wounds of the crucifixion depicted in his hands and in his feet. Standing strong in the midst of the icon, surrounded by the just of the Old Testament, including St. John the Baptist, who points to him as he pointed in life that this is the Lamb of God. He points to those in the, among the dead that this is the one who will destroy death. He is tra trampling down upon the doors of Hades. Death is personified as an old man who is now chained because his power is destroyed. And he holds in either hand the progenitors of the race depicted of these old man and woman, Adam and Eve. And significantly, he doesn't hold them by their hand. He holds their wrist and raises them up if you hold somebody by the hand, they slip. You hold them by the wrist. You have them, you hold them. They're yours. You raise them up. So, the resurrection of Christ, as depicted, indicates 
that his resurrection is not a matter just of his own. It has the power to raise humankind. Surrounded by the just of the Old Testament, in fact, in some icons, an anachronistic thing, the disciples are depicted with the eschatological hope of the resurrection, when he will come again to judge the living and the dead and raise all from the dead and give life. While it would be unwise to read too much into this teaching without sufficient background, the idea of Christ's subversion and despoiling of death is an important aspect of his passion and resurrection. God himself in the form of Jesus Christ entered so completely into the human experience that he entered into the process of death, except that God as the source of all life could not die, at least not in the same sense that we do. Death is the absence of life. How can life itself experience death? First and foremost, we must understand that he died. He really died. But unlike us, who immediately upon death, immediately, our body begins to corrupt. His body remains incorruptible. Why? Because he is hypostatically united to the second person of the Trinity, to the Son of God. And so he experiences death as we experience it, save for the fact that he remains incorruptible. And so therefore, while all our graves, all our tombs are filth and corruption, the church calls his grave or tomb life-giving because out of this tomb springs eternal life. Again, the icon of the resurrection in our church, usually referred to as the descent into Hades, incorporates all these teachings of the church and indicates, among other things, that in the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection as a promise is given to every human being. The crucifixion and the resurrection Again, they're the centerpiece of our faith. And the two events go together. You can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. So crucifixion leads us to resurrection. We put the two together all the time. You never get them far apart. And we certainly make the resurrection the centerpiece. You can't have it without a crucifixion. The centerpiece of an Orthodox church isn't just a cross that you can see in some churches. It's a resurrected Christ. and You have to put the two together. Because if you only end on the crucifixion story, you leave dejected. Just the way the disciples did when Christ died, and they figure, this is over. Jesus Christ was not the first person who was crucified, and he certainly wasn't the last. And so if you just end it at that story, it's over. But it's the resurrection that changes everything. When thou, the Redeemer of all, hadst been laid for all in the new tomb, Hades, the respecter of none, saw thee and crouched in fear. The bars broke, the gates were shattered, the graves were opened, the dead arose. Then Adam, thankfully rejoicing, cried out to thee, Glory to thy condescension, O merciful Master. This icon, the visitation of the mare-bearing woman to the empty tomb, who are there, they find the angels who tell them to go tell the disciples of the resurrection. It shows an empty tomb and an angel or angels clothed in white sitting on them, declaring to the myrrh-bearing woman that why are you here? Him who you seek is not here, he is risen. Go tell the disciples. Why? because we do not know from the scriptures the time of Christ's resurrection, only that it occurred in the early morning hours of what we now call Sunday, the first day of the week. And there is no immediate 
witness to that event, the exact moment of that event. 